Welcome everybody to our Tuesday, September 5th city council meeting being held obviously here in chambers. And we also have a remote component for everybody to join by Zoom. Uh, we're going to start off with our invocation given by council member Dunn followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join us. Father in heaven, we are grateful for this opportunity to come together uh, to listen and to speak of the place we call home. Lead and inspire us to appreciate and to recognize each other's perspective and to lead us to do the right thing. Amen. 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 Pledge I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Start off with roll call, which should be pretty easy tonight. Councilmember Cargill. Present. Councilmember Kurtz. Present. Councilmember Van Orman. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Foyer. Here. Councilmember Spencer. Present. Councilmember Dunn. Happy to be here. And Councilmember Salberg. Here. All right, all present and accounted for. Makes things easy. All right, we are going to agenda approval. Mayor Pro Tem, I think we have a couple adjustments. Uh, sure. Oh, uh, I, I have. Did Kelsey get with you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I have one of my own. Okay. I'd like to propose. I'd like to move item 10 F to general business. And what? And uh, uh, item 10 E? Yeah. <laughs> to general business. Okay. <laughs> Somebody second. else's request. All right, we have a motion and a second to move general business 10 E and F to, uh, sorry, action items um, 10. Okay. Oh, good 10. gosh. Okay. Consent agenda items E and F to general business A, 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 and, A and B. So, any discussion? We asked, yeah, we got a second from um, Dan. Okay. Uh, second from oh, sorry. Um, all right, we have a motion and a second. Yes, go ahead. Does anybody else need to make any changes to the agenda? Were there any other ones wanted to move? Okay, just Doesn't sound like it. Okay, great. All right, all in favor of moving those two items under general business, please say aye. 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 All right, any opposed? All right, we have a motion to approve the amended agenda. I make a motion to approve the amended agenda. Second. 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 Okay, second by Council Member uh, Kurtz. All right, all in favor of approving the agenda as amended, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries 7-0. So the workshop item for the flock safety, uh, oh. the representative from flock isn't able to be here tonight and would like to postpone to the 19th. You need to learn to interrupt me better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have an updated agenda. Yeah. So do we need to remove it from the agenda? Yeah. Okay, I'll make another amendment to the uh, agenda removing item 9A flock safety. So second. We have a second from Councilman Van Orman. Any questions? Not hearing any. All those in favor of removing workshop discussion nine, please say aye. 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 All right. Do we need to reapprove the amended agenda? Okay, good. We're good. We're good. All right. Thanks, Sean. All right. We will move on to citizen comments. So for those here in chambers, we do have some uh, comment slips. I never know if they're yellow or white over there on the table next to uh Deputy Chief Morgan, if you can fill that out um, and turn it in, we'll get you on the agenda here for citizen comment. For those online, if there's anybody want, wanting to make a comment, please send a note to, to Jacob uh, in the chat. Uh, he's our meeting host and he will let me know. Just a reminder that citizen comments are limited to three minutes. They are comment only. If there's something we need to get back to you on, we will get your make sure we have your contact information. So do we have anybody here in chambers? Nope. Do we have anybody online? Okay. Just a reminder, there's an op another opportunity at the end of the meeting. Moving on to announcements, proclamations, and special presentations. So we have a proclamation declaring um, September 2023 as National Service Dog Month, whereas the City of Liberty Lake believes in the joyful, transformative power of the human canine bond and inclusivity of all citizens. And whereas in the United States, 64 million American adults and children have a disability and only 16,000 service dogs from accredited training programs exist nationwide and the need is growing. And whereas Canine Companions is a nonprofit organization that enhances the lives of people with disabilities by providing expertly trained dog, 
expertly trained service dogs and ongoing support to ensure quality partnerships. And whereas canine companions and their service dogs empower people with disabilities to lead life with greater independence by providing best in class training, ongoing follow up services and a deeply committed community of support. And whereas National Service Dog Month aims to educate our community about the benefits of service dogs and the laws protecting them. And whereas the City of Liberty Lake continues to work toward becoming an inclusive community in which all citizens and their service dogs are embraced. All right, so before we move on to the proclamation, um, do we have a motion to support this proclamation? Move to support. All right, we have a second, second. We have a second from Council Member Kurtz. Any discussion? All right, all in favor of uh, supporting the proclamation for National Service Dog Month, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Now, therefore, we, Mayor and Council Members of the City of Liberty Lake, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2023 as National Service Dog Month in the City of Liberty Lake, Washington. Further, we encourage all citizens to celebrate task-trained service dogs and be respectful of the rights afforded to the adults, children, and veterans who lead more independent lives because of their assistance. All right, I don't know if you wanted to say anything this time around, and then I'll sign this and I'll come up and give it to you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having us a second year in a row. Um, this is Carrie Ann and Dawn, her husband, and this is the star of the show, Boswell. <laughs> this is my husband, Sean, and my name is Joanne. And we're members of Canine Companions, which is, uh, of course, an assist training organization, a nonprofit. And as the proclamation shares, you know, there are many requests throughout the United States. Last year, we were over 500 requests nationwide. Now we're over 600 requests nationwide in the need of these training dogs. I'll leave some pamphlets there in the foyer, and we certainly need more puppy raisers and trainers. So if you're interested, please let us know. Our group goes as far south as the University of Idaho and Lewiston, and far north is Sandpoint, far east is Missoula, and then here in Spokane. Okay. Thank you for having right, us. Well, let me come out the door and back in. Well, thank you guys for recognizing this pasta. <laughs> Sorry, I raised my hand. Um, I would like to thank you guys for recognizing this. Um, uh, Service Dog Month. It's very important, not only to me, but to many other disabled people. I was hit by a drunk driver inside his store when I was 19. And um, I didn't get a service dog till after I retired from working for the federal government in a rehab capacity. Um, also, I'm a two time Paralympian. And at once I retired from doing all that, my health started declining even more and the need for a service dog was very much needed for me and this is my second service dog but first with canine companions and i tell you they're <laughs> they give me my independence they're an icebreaker for those there's a lot of disabled people out there that don't they hide in the closet they won't go out they they're afraid to show their disability or be around other people well Boswell has been an icebreaker, but I've always been very independent anyway, but um, he, he's just great. He's been my partner now for five years. Um, and like Jill Lynn said, this is an awesome organization. And thank you guys again for recognizing. I truly appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We appreciate you coming. So if somebody wants to get involved and, and be a puppy raiser, what's what does it entail? Loving dogs. Yeah, the private person has. Yeah, and we have training and classes for them. Absolutely. It's a support group out of the area that I just shared, and you've got a good one. And you can even volunteer or you can be a participator as well. Yeah. Like they do. They do. Joe and Sean, they do a lot of stuff. Without them, 
we can, you know, they come to our parade, we hold our posters as we're marching in the parade. We, we march in a parade in Sandpoint every year for the 4th of July for the Lions Club. Also, uh, we, um, they, um, they come and sit, like they said, they're the, right now, I think they're probably sitting in one of the retired boats. Um, they decide that the career change was better than being a service dog or guide dog or whatever. And so, uh, but she still knows all the commands and she, she would have been a per perfect service dog and she didn't have that fear or didn't want to be away from the puppy race or catch fish. So yeah, it's it's wonderful organization. I volunteer now for it. Uh, and I go around and do things, uh, speaking and um, and helping her by volunteer and doing things. And that's another reason I'm here. I just wanted to come in person and thank you all. No, we appreciate you bringing bringing this to everybody's attention. Yeah, yeah. thanks for coming. Yeah, they're they're like I said, my treasure, and for many of those who were like felt that they had to stay indoors and and allow those people go out and volunteer because they have their friends and family. Like if I brought something, he picks it up because um, I'm not supposed to be bending down because <laughs> I've had six back surgeries. So he'll pick things up if I drop him. He'll open and close doors. He'll take stuff out of the dryer if you want him to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll pull a laundry basket. You can open the refrigerator and get you something out of there. With, you know, like Sean King, you might want a beer. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The thing with Boswell, I have two other lads at home, and I'm afraid they can help themselves to other things. You know, so, but they're, you know, they're great. And like him, he's an eye opener where I go to the doctors. He's better treated than I am. With the <laughs> Thank you all my doctors and animal lovers. So, but thank you again. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for coming, you guys. Yeah. All right, we will move over to reports and inquiries. First, uh, are there any city council reports? Councilmember Dunn. Uh, I'll throw one. Um, it was a great back to school night tonight for everybody at Liberty Creek and Liberty, Liberty Lake Elementary. Um, it was really inspiring to see all the kiddos and their families out creating community. Um, so I just want to recognize that's a big part of what we do, as well as uh, not to mention a Riverview Little League game out on our diamonds. And so tonight it was just one of these classic moments of summer here for us in the community. Um, I want to recognize our work at the symphony event also. The event from a week ago Saturday was, I think, appreciated by all. Um, a beautiful day, beautiful weather, and uh, just a great, great thanks to the city staff and all their support and the coordination and the action to present it in the community. I think it's something that's beloved by all of us. Um, and then not to slow down, next up is the rim ride this coming Saturday, as well as the city event. We'll go through the agenda. But these are all opportunities for everybody to get out and be a part of the community, uh, to get to know your neighbor and to engage with those around you. So just really want to encourage you to get out there. Okay. All right. Anybody else? City Council. Councilmember Van Orman. Sure, we met as uh, the um, Lodging Tax Commission on August 23rd. Uh, I think we've got some things coming forward to the council before the end of the year, which will much benefit not only creating more revenue for the two uh, hotels that we have here in, within the city, um, but to also benefit more of the organizations that are on the receiving end. Great. We also have for Lions Club, uh, the leader dog, uh, which also is a service dog organization for the blind. So this is great that we recognized another entity for such a, with puppies all over the place for <laughs> the farmer's market. Hey, you can't go wrong. Um, and then also for uh, October, we are planning on the bed races. Okay. So I'm hoping everybody wants to put a bed race team together to benefit the local community. 100% of our proceeds goes back to the community. What's for the date for that? October 28th. Okay. More is coming. Right. Make a note of that. Okay, any other council reports? Councilmember Spencer. This is more of an inquiry. I had uh, somebody reach out to me and ask uh, why we don't have barriers on the west side of Liberty Lake Road, south of Country Vista. 
And um, I, I didn't have an answer for that. So I thought I'd kind of bring it forward and perhaps that's something we look at as we get into budgeting season. I know that that's come up before um, and it's been several years. And at the time um, I was told there wasn't enough room. I don't know mm. the, the engineering behind that, but it's definitely something, um, Lisa, if we, we can follow up on that and get an answer back, that'd be great. Thanks. Mm. Anybody else? All right, uh, jump in the mayor's report. I will go through as quickly as I can, but a lot's been going on. Uh, so uh, we've had um, a few more meetings with the Regional Homeless Authority. Uh, if you guys have been watching the news, obviously the Spokane City Council came back with lots of questions on it, as does the Valley. So discussions are still ongoing. Um, biggest question is, um, you know, who's going to continue with the work? The three volunteers, I think we're trying to get out of it by by October, um, but there's doesn't seem that there's going to be an, an agreement to move anything forward before then. So more to come on that. Uh, we've had some additional meetings with Greenstone regarding mission. More of that will come um, later on in the city administrator report. Um, gave an update to the rotary um, in the new rotary room. It worked out really well. A uh, great room to meet in. Um, we're also having some discussions with Executech with regards to our 2024 support plan. Um, worked, working with the SRTC Administrative Board on the 2024 budget for SRTC. It's a much easier budget to get through than ours. And it was quite pleasant. Um, been interviewing for a couple of our open positions. Uh, I also had a really great lunch meeting with the CEO of AWC, Dina Dawson. Um, they, there were also mayors there from Spokane Valley, Millwood, Rockford, Cheney, and Spokane, and a couple of the other AWC board members from Spokane and the Valley. We really were trying, to, it was kind of, it was really nice um, kind of putting all of the politics aside at that lunch and just talking about things um, that we could, that we really need AWC's help on to focus on Eastern Washington. And of course, you know, public safety was one of them. Some very interesting discussions on that, especially from the communities who contract with the county. Um, it's very interesting what they can and can't do. And, you know, if they want say red light cameras or something, they can't have those because the county doesn't support it. So it was an interesting discussion. And we were also talking obviously about the homelessness and as well as a possible waiver or grandfather clausing in the fire victims um, who have lost who lost their homes in the last month or so. Uh, most of them were on natural gas or propane and um, the natural gas ban was postponed from July 1st to October 1st, um, which will affect, unless it gets postponed again, it will affect these people trying to rebuild and it'll make rebuilding more expensive. So they're already working on address, trying to address this with the legislature to either have it postponed for the fire victims or like I said, a grandfather clause, you know, it could be semantics, right? It's a rebuild, not a new build, um, but they are working on that. And so is uh, Suzanne Schmidt, um, representative for the fourth district. She had an update um, meeting about, about a week ago and um, we discussed this. So legislature is already looking at that to help out those families. Um, an upcoming GSI board meeting, GSI, um, count, uh, GSI in the county, state of the county, SRTC board of directors meetings coming up. Uh, we are, Mark and I are doing a follow-up with um, SRTC CEO Lois Bolenbeck. I'm um, just kind of just do a yearly check-in on SRTC and, and our engagement. Um, Spokane County Council of Governments is coming up this Friday. And what I'm really interested in, in attending um, the following week is the Spokane, Spokane County Measure 1 briefing. Measure 1 is their 0.2% um, sales tax. I don't know if you guys have watched the news, but there was, um, there was a, I guess, an appeal, for lack of a better word, as to for their wording uh, on that measure. Um, so we're, it was interesting. I've never gotten an invitation only invitation. Usually we can forward things and, you know, maybe, you know, invite Mark to come along um, or Sean, but this was invitation only. So I will report back on that after that meeting. Um, so I think that's it for me. And Mayor, yes, go ahead. Do you want to push the um, Council of Governments event on Friday? Yes. Yeah, I mentioned that. Okay, yep. sorry. Yeah, go ahead. At, at the, uh, at the, along with the opening of the Spokane Rudy County Fair. Fair. Yep. All right, uh, City Administrator. All right, thank you, Mayor, uh, City Council. We've got a couple of events and reminders to, to point out. Uh, as hard as it may be to believe, especially for someone like, say, my daughter, uh, Central Valley Schools are starting up again on September the 7th, and so that's going to change traffic patterns. 
Um, and so be aware of that. Um, all the kids are going to be going back to school. <clears throat> and this next item is going to affect it in a different way. We have our Kramer Bridge ribbon cutting on September the 9th at 10 a.m. Everybody should have that on their calendar. We're expecting um, several speakers. Uh, the chamber is going to MC that event. Um, we're going to have a couple of tents out there with folks that are going to be reminding folks about bike safety and some other things. And so then after the ribbon cutting and the ceremony, we're going to invite people to ride over the new bridge. Uh, and then after the riders, the golf carters over the new bridge, uh, north on Kramer, around the roundabout and mission, and then back. Um, and so all of that to open the new north-south connection uh, for Liberty Lake, which is a, a great development. It's going to do wonders, I think, for uh, traffic circulation and just the area in general. And so we're looking forward to that. It's been a long time coming. Um, I'll take this opportunity also to remind everybody uh, of the traffic signal there has been put into flash operation, which uh, means that it operates as a four-way stop, um, and it's going to continue to do that until uh, the early a.m. of September 11th. And so it'll be in flash uh, between certainly between now and, and the 11th, and it will be in flash on the day of the ribbon cutting. So keep that in mind. And we posted some information about um, the signal operation and what uh, drivers should do in response. And we'll continue to do that to remind people. Mark, as a clarification, and um, I apologize, Lisa, if you had replied to my email, I didn't have a chance to check up this afternoon. The bridge will be open at that point with the four-way stop, correct or not? That is correct. Okay, so it will be open right after right after the ceremony, but with the four-way. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. But not until then. Right, not until then. <laughs> Council Member Dunn mentioned the uh, rim ride, so I'm not going to repeat that other than to say one, one of those rides starts on, uh, or is on Saturday. The All of, all of the others are on Sunday. So again, there are going to be some different things happening traffic-wise over the next several days. So regarding events and reminders, any any questions about those things? Um, we also have the Cops and Cruisers event on the 16th at Meadowood Tech. Meadowood Tech, good yeah. good catch. Sure. All right, moving on to the strategic plan update. Uh, my hope was to have a more thorough update this evening on the heels of our uh, August 22nd workshop. Um, but some other things came up that kind of prevented that. And so right now, what I'm hoping to have done is uh, to give you a draft version of the strategic plan with the consensus that was built on the 22nd by September the 12th, so that we can discuss it again on September the 19th, um, which is the next council meeting. And so uh, that is September the 12th is a week from tonight. So between tonight and a week from tonight, expect to see a draft version of the plan come your way. Um, and in the interim period between that and the next council meeting, if there are questions, concerns, needs to discuss, let me know, and we can certainly do that. Um, this is designed to be a, a, an interactive process, and to the extent that we can do that without meeting, um, I want to open that opportunity. Uh, any questions about that? All right, so we're going to move on. Uh, unfortunately, the flock rep could not be with us tonight to give a full presentation, but I want uh, Chief Simmons to give you a bit of an update with respect to the strategy that we think is the, the most appropriate one moving forward. And then um, on the heels of that, we'll make sure that we bring the flock rep back to fill in the gaps and talk about um, some other ways for those systems to be integrated. So Chief, are you here? I am online. All right, take it away. Thank you, Mark. Um, good evening, uh, Council, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, as we uh, continue to improve our technology within the city and use this technology to um, expand our ability to safeguard the public, I believe that it's imperative that we establish and maintain a system of best practices uh, related to purchasing, use, and evaluation of this technology. Um, recently, there has been some discussion uh, on purchasing flock license plate recognition cameras for homeowners associations within the city. And after uh, extensive and ongoing discussions with uh, with our city administrator, Mark McAvoy, and um, our leadership team um, at the Liberty Lake Police Department, as well as um, 
members of Flock and also uh, meeting with some members of uh, a couple of the HOAs in our community. Um, it is uh, my recommendation that um, the purchasing option and responsibility of Flock and any other similar technology for HOAs remain solely with, with these entities. Um, if HOAs or any other private party or parties um, within our city purchase and utilize technology such as Flock, they do have the option to share access with those resource uh, or resources with law enforcement, um, especially with the establishment of our um, real-time uh, crime center uh, that the county um, has um, started to put together and is, is pretty far along on right now. Pretty excited about that, but there are some abilities there that the public will have to share um, those resources and those technologies with law enforcement um, uh, in order to help safeguard our communities. Um, again, establishing and maintaining a system of best practices is important in my opinion. Um, and I believe that it will establish a foundation of equity first and foremost within our community when it comes to private entities such as HOAs and businesses and other private entities, um, uh, as well as um, uh, help with uh, information technology security and other securities that go along with um, having these um, uh, resources and tools in our community and other variables that's related to best practices in our day-to-day -day operations as a city. Um, as Kelsey and Mark said um, earlier, uh, we will have a flock rep available. I apologize. Um, the flock rep that I'd normally work with um, has some health issues right now and he had to, um, um, as we say in, in track, uh, pass the baton um, at third leg to um, another rep. Um, and they weren't available tonight. So they're available on the 19th. Uh, I started communicating with them today about 4 p.m. And we plan on talking a little bit more either tomorrow or uh, some other time this this week in regards to, to this. But again, um, tentatively now, um, a rep will be available to present to the council and the citizens of Liberty Lake um, the technologies, and I'm going to say technologies because Flock has a lot of different technologies, not only for law enforcement, but also for private parties, other than LPRs um, that help with um, public safety. So um, I'm available for any questions, concerns, or comments right now, uh, and I'll open the floor up to you, Council. Okay, I've got a, count, a question from Councilmember Salberg. Thanks, Chief, and I understand, <clears throat> I think, the reasons for um, keeping things separate um but can we um have a private meeting coffee or something like that sometime to talk about um the direction since we don't have our representative here tonight and then how we would integrate and connect with the city if we had one in our hoa as well or if we had yeah. several in our hoa yes sir definitely okay expect an invitation soon yes sir Anybody else have any questions? <clears throat> Does not look like it. We'll look forward to that uh, at the next meeting, Chief. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thanks. All right, moving on. Um, it, council remembers, uh, it may have been last meeting, but within the last two meetings, uh, you approved a change order to the public works yard. And so I want uh, Lisa to provide an update for you on the progress of that project. Lisa? Well, thank you. Uh, Jacob, can you pull up my email, please? Or my my PowerPoint, please? We're working on it. If it's easier, Jacob, I can. If you can allow me to share my screen, I can do that as well. Here we go. Awesome. Thank you, um, Mayor, Council Members. Um, just a quick update on the status of the Public Works Building. Next slide, please. Um, so we do have uh, some work still remaining. Uh, the schedule right now is looking like the installation of bathroom fixtures will be completed in the next uh, week to two weeks. 
Um, installation of the, the three exterior doors. Um, we're anticipating delivery this week with installation by the end of next week. The HVAC for, for the office uh, break room area and the inline exhaust fan, they're currently on order and they're anticipated to be delivered in mid-September. Uh, floors, uh, uh, the ceiling of the floors will be completed within the next two weeks. We do have to have a fire marshal inspection upon substantial completion. And we are looking at right now a possible move in the end of September or the first week in October. Next slide, please. So just to give you an overview of the status of the finances on this project. So originally, Council, you authorized a, a contract amount of $1,911,988. Uh, that included both the shelf for the building and the, the um, engineered mezzanine. Um, you also authorized uh, a staff managed contingency of $378,012. That contingency covers sales tax as well as testing and uh, um, change orders that with a project of this magnitude are, uh, there will inevitably be some change orders. And then at the last council meeting, you also um, authorized an additional consent contingency of $30,000 to allow us to proceed with HVAC for the office and break room area. So today, uh, the total council authorized expenditure for this project is 2,320,000. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm not gonna go through these uh, change orders in a lot of detail, but I did want to list them for you. Um, there were uh, there was one that was voided. There was one that was a no cost change due to a lack of availability. We had two that were actually credits, but the majority of these were things that either hadn't been anticipated or at the end, as we discussed, had been, um, had been authorized in order to um, um, maximize the functionality the the the, um, the facility once it had been uh, once it was completed. Next slide, please. So again, your original contract amount was one point nine million and change. The sales tax on the original contract amount was one hundred and seventy thousand one hundred and sixty seven dollars. Uh, uh, you approved change orders to date with tax or 210,000 and change. And um, Darden has, uh, has uh, the total of all these is 2.2 million um, that has been authorized from Darden. We also have had almost $8,000 in testing expenses to date. Um, so the total authorized expenditure um, is 230,000 $596 to date. Assuming we don't have any other change orders, um, we will have a little, uh, we will have a charge for the fire marshal's inspection. That's not a, a significant cost. So again, council, you've authorized a budget of 2,320,000 and remaining contingency after all of the authorized expenditures to date is 19,000 and change. So that is kind of wanted to give you an update on where we were with the budget. Um, and uh, with that, I stand for any questions. Anybody have any questions? I don't see any. Awesome. Well, Thanks thank for you. The update, Lisa. Thank you. Looking forward to it. I've purposely stayed away because I want to see it when it's finished. It's getting very close. Yes. All right. All right, so moving on, um, as you, most of you were uh, there last, what was that, last Thursday when we had the, or Tuesday, Tuesday, when we had the uh, ribbon cutting for the Trailhead Clubhouse. And so we wanted to provide you with a update this evening on the progress of the restaurant. And so as all of you know, we have a lease with the Bent Grass Public House that was executed last December, um, and it's in good standing. Uh, we're not in the lease is not in default. It's not approaching default. 
Uh, we had a follow-up conversation after our last conversation with council with uh, Bent Grass, and, and Bent Grass remains optimistic about the prospect of its opening in Trailhead uh, in spring of 2024. Um, so according to the lease, just a couple of other reminders, according to the lease, the rent payments for the restaurant itself uh, begin either when Bent Grass uh, occupies the space or on January 1st of 2024, whichever is sooner. Um, and so at, at this point in time, it looks as though the January, 20, uh, January 1st of 2024 is going to be the sooner. So we would expect for rent payments to begin coming from Bent Grass to the city in January of 2024. In advance of that, the lease also requires that they begin paying triple net expenses um, in July of this year. So this past July, uh, we've invoiced uh, for those expenses, which are as essentially internal maintenance or interior maintenance, water and sewer, and then electricity on a prorated basis or a proportional basis. And so there's no indication that uh, at this point that, that Bitgrass is not going to pay those invoices They've expressed an understanding and a willingness, even an enthusiasm about paying those invoices. And so we don't expect anything different. And so at this point in time, there's nothing to indicate that uh, there's any other plan. And our expectation is, is that they continue to move forward. And we would expect to see them opening uh, on this timeline of spring of 2024. And so that's that's the information that we have to share this evening. And if there are any questions, we'll try to answer them as best we can. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Mark? Okay. All right. Um, in that case, we're going to move on. This is another item that's come before council fairly recently. And uh, as a result of a conversation that the city had with uh, Greenstone last week, we wanted to give you an update on the East Mission Project. So I'll invite Lisa back to the uh, mic. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Mayor and council members, we did meet with Joe and Jim Frank um, time flies when you're having fun. I can't remember if it was a week or two ago, but um, we did have a conversation uh, related to um, how to move forward. Um, we had seen um, an email that uh, Poe Asphalt had sent to a project manager um, with WashDOT on how they would interpret their construction standards. Um, it was relatively limited in the in the way they framed the question, and we felt that it was important that they have more detail to the question. So we asked that question again of the person who, the project manager who had responded to Poe Asphalt's original email, and we asked two other project managers at WashDOT how they would interpret it. And basically, the crux of the question was whether um, the project managers would consider the two um, that the two sections of the roadway that are separated by the roundabout that was not part of the project, if they would treat it as one project, or if they would, or if they could evaluate the data collected through the coring separately. And uh, we got two different answers, two completely different answers. And uh, looking at the coring, we had four, four cores that actually fell below the threshold that would fail the entire project on the west side. We only had two cores on the east side because it was a much smaller area. And while neither of those cores met our four inch minimum standard, they did, the average of the two did uh, just barely meet WashDOT's minimum tolerance. Neither of them was so low that it would, would have rejected that side of the roadway. So one project manager um, said that they would have passed the west side or past the, excuse me, past the east side and failed the west side, the other project manager would said that they would fail the entire project. So we didn't get an answer from the third one, but we were left with the understanding that this was a matter of professional judgment. And so 
we when we met with um with Greenstone, we had that very discussion. And we had the discussion about it was a matter we knew all along that it would be very difficult to deal with the pavement thickness given the super elevation. It wasn't a simple, it's not a simple just do an overlay what like we did on the west side, which or, or, which turned out not to be that simple, but we got it done. It would be much more challenging on the east side. However, because we had because we had um, because we had hired parametrics to come up with the solution for the west side, we discovered two problems that represented safety issues. One had to do with the one had to do with the um, location of the bike ramp, and as you will recall, because the roadway is a foot narrower than what the plans had shown originally, it ends up that as the bike ramp. Um, uh, at the bike ramp, the, the bike lane is actually only three feet wide. It's at the neck of the roundabout. So I'm sure you all have the same image that I have of somebody on a bicycle getting clipped by the, the mirror on a honking big truck. And so that's the concern. Our minimum, our minimum lane width for, for um, a bike lane is five feet. Um, and that's standard, that's an AASHTO standard. Three feet is substandard for sure, and it presents a safety concern. The other concern that we had is because the crown was not centered on this section of roadway and the striping followed the crown, we end up with a, a lane that is less than our minimum width, and it also um, also problematic. So. At the end of the day, what we agreed with Greenstone, what Greenstone agreed with us, is that um, they were willing to address the bike ramp and they were willing to address the um, willing to address the restriping. They also agreed that at the end of the project, when with the record drawings, they would provide the documentation for the design deviation that we needed for the. Um, for the uh, super elevation, which we've said all along that we needed. So those, those were the three determinations. We've talked to parametrics. Parametrics is very close to having being done. The bike lane design or the bike ramp relocation is already done or needs to be final tweaked to finalize it. The striping plan is already done. And so um, we don't have yet a schedule from parametrics because the designer was on vacation. We should have that this week. Um, parametrics is going to provide us with the plans and they will inspect the repairs as a third party engineer, just as they did on the West side. And so we have an agreement in principle. We have not yet gotten the final design to Greenstone, but we have an agreement in principle on this approach. So with that, again, if you have any questions, I'm happy to respond if I know the answer. And if not, I'll find out the answer. Any questions? I don't see any, Lisa. Thanks for digging in on this and getting the other opinions. Thank All you. Right. Okay, we'll move on. All right, moving on. So uh, given that uh, Labor Day is kind of traditionally the kickoff of the November election season, we had staff had always intended to come to council on tonight's meeting and, and provide a briefing of a couple of things that we've been talking about over the course of several months, uh, just because we felt it was appropriate to do that at, at this time. And so unfortunately, as everybody knows, there, there was an incident that occurred that kind of changes some of the uh, significance of, of one of these topics, and, and I'll address that in, in a minute when I get to that uh, piece of it. But I want to start out with the social media piece. We had a workshop back in February, I think it was, to talk about the city's code of ethics. And there's a, there's a social media piece of that that talks specifically about um, the, the fact that the city prefers that um, what it calls professional and um, it, it's talking about representative representatives communication, and it's talking about using 
uh, publicly owned versus private accounts. And I realize we have a mixture of both of those things. And, and the reason that I wanted to point it out again is because with the in intensity and increasing frequency of social communication, social media communications, there is a burden of preservation on the owner of private accounts. And so I just want to remind everyone of that as we enter this season, that if it's not an account that is owned or maintained by the city, there is a, there is a burden of retention. And so just keep that in mind as you're using these various accounts to communicate, um, especially if it relates to anything um, with city business or that could be construed as a public record. Um, and, and we can talk specifically about some examples of what that may be uh, individually. I don't want to necessarily get into that tonight because you can go down a hundred different rabbit trails. We had that discussion back in February and, and talked about multiple examples then. And so it's just a reminder at this point to keep that in mind, especially with respect to the retention requirements. Any questions on that before we move on? Okay, uh, so moving on to use of facilities. We had some discussions about this early on um, and, and we talked about uh, different aspects of this. And the, there's an RCW that covers this. It's 42.17a.555. The Public Disclosure Commission publishes guidelines on all kinds of different things that uh, it recommends to do, to not do, to consider. Um, and, and this one in particular, I wanted to highlight because we've had some requests, we've had some uh, recent requests to use what are technically referred to as city facilities for campaign purposes. And so as you look through the RCW and as you look through the Public Disclosure Commission recommendations, um, it, really what I want to point out is that there is an exception in those rules for areas or facilities that are normally used for gathering purposes. And really the, the exception is that the, the government, in this case us, the city, makes those facilities available on a non-discriminatory and equal access basis for political use. So in other words, if some person uses it for that purpose, would we allow anyone else to use it for that purpose, all things being equal? The answer is yes. And so if there's a desire to use a, say, a park space, we have certain uh, rental room or rooms available to rent or to use at the library, those kinds of spaces, those can be used for these purposes as long as we are not discriminating and we're making them available on a non-discriminatory basis and providing equal access for all. And so that, that would be the intention. And so if there is an issue with respect to use of those spaces, we would fall back on this guidance from not only the PDC, but also the RCW directly. And so um, if there are any questions about that at this point, I'd be glad to address them and also rely on Sean's expertise and uh, helping to provide detail. I have one question. Yes, Who sir. authorizes the exemption? The the exemption is authorized in the RCW. So RCW 42, what was that again? It is 42.17a.555. And you're saying that RCW allows for an exemption of your examples, but who authorizes the exemption? So the exemption is there in the RCW. And so we would be allowed- So it calls out specific facilities? No. I haven't read it yet, so I'm, that's why I'm asking. No, it talks about exempting the prohibition um, in the cases where there is a not, so basically what it says, I'll read it to you. It says, the so RC, this is coming from the Public Disclosure Commission. It says RCW 42.17a.555 does not prevent a public office or agency from a making facilities available on a non-discriminatory equal access basis for political uses. And so the, the prohibition does not eliminate us from making those facilities available for that use if we make it available in a non-discriminatory way, providing equal access to everyone. So you could read that as it doesn't prevent it, but it doesn't authorize it either. It's not required is what I'm saying. Correct. That's right. Yeah, it's not requiring that we do that. Right. So who would make that determination? Well, essentially, the city has made the determination that if 
someone asks to use the park for that purpose or the room available at the library for that purpose, we are not going to uh, disallow that use as long as we keep it available for others who may have a similar request. Okay. And it's my understanding that has been a long-standing practice. Okay. Any other questions for Mark on that one? All right. Uh, talking about political signs, we have a uh, development code, city development code, uh, chapter 10 or title 10. And the specific section is 10-3E-5A10. And it is specifically called political campaign signs. Been a lot of talk about this recently, and I'll get into that in just a minute. But essentially, uh, signs promoting or publicizing candidates or issues in an election um, may be displayed on private property with the consent of the property owner. That's straightforward. And then signs shall not be located on public property within public easements or within street right of way. And so that code is what the city is enforcing. Um, and in order to enforce that code, we typically use uh, the, the scout data layers that show the, the property lines. The reason that we use that, and it's not perfect, uh, but the reason that we use that is because that's the most objective source that we can use to define those property boundaries. And so what I will tell the council is that uh, up until this point, um, the, the city, meaning currently, the city does not have a, a proactive code enforcement um, program, meaning that most of our code enforcement is done based on request, based on complaint. Um, and so when that occurs, we send someone out to check out whatever the complaint is, whatever the request is, and then we respond to that. And so in the case of uh, this particular instance, if, if there was a complaint that there was a sign in the right of way, we would use Scout to check and verify that. But the, the guidance has been if it's close, meaning if you have to pull out a tape measure to determine whether it is or is not, leave it alone. Right, that's been the guidance that city has given to staff. Um, as you all know, there were a couple of collections of signs that were removed that after a review and a bunch of other uh, discussion with staff, we've determined that a staff member did in fact remove those signs off of private property. Um, that was done uh, with uh, essentially a, a mistake, a misunderstanding that that individual had of the instruction he received um, and did not go back and verify, uh, in this case, with Scout, what those areas were, specifically whether they were on private property or right away. So we believe we've made that correction. We believe that the staff, under, the entire staff understands what the process is what they need to do in order to verify. And like I said, if it's close, to leave it alone. And so going forward, that's what we would expect to see. Um, and so given that uh, that is different from what our code says, um, I wanted to make sure that we address that this evening and obviously then give council an opportunity to ask questions. Councilmember Cargill. So, Mark, I have a couple of questions for you. For sure. Um, you said that <clears throat> this is not proactive, that we basically rely on a complaint to come in and then we take the steps. Is that right? Essentially. Is that what we did this time as well? In this particular case, there was a complaint that was um, provided about a specific area. And for whatever reason, in the uh, research and resolution of that complaint, the instruction was interpreted in a way uh, that um, prompted this particular individual to pick up signs outside of that complaint. So did the complaint come from a citizen? No. Yes. Ultimately, yes. But someone outside of City Hall? What I'm trying to determine is, when yes, did this complaint 
Okay. A resident, yes. Okay. Um, second question I had is, and I think it's important for the public to know this, um, you, you talked about the employee who, who, who did this. I'm trying to figure out why the employee told us originally that they didn't remove the signs when we asked them multiple times, but then when the video came back, then they said, okay, they removed the signs. Right. I, I think that, and it's hard for me to answer for someone else, um, but I, I believe that the person believed when they were answering the question that they had followed the instruction that they were given and, and didn't believe they were answering incorrectly. They believed they were answering the question correctly. It was only after the wider conversation occurred that that realization was proven to be not accurate. So the, the question wasn't, did you remove the signs? It was, did you not measure or? No, the question was, did anyone remove signs from private property, essentially? Okay. Because that's what we had been told happened. And that's what we were trying to find out um, whether, because our original uh, belief was that we were not the ones who went out and did that because we only had a complaint about one area and that area was right. confirmed to be in the right of way. And so there was no reason to believe that anyone had done that. And so that's why we asked the question uh, in that way. Now, I, I didn't personally ask the question, but that's how supervisory staff asked the question. Yep. Anybody else? Councilmember Spencer. Um, yeah, my first question was, uh, what was the instruction that the supervisor gave the employee? You said the employee misinterpreted it, but what was the actual instruction? I would have to get the verbatim instruction for them, but essentially it was, we have a complaint about signs in the right of way at the near the intersection of Appleway and Moulter go check it out. If they're in the right of way, remove them. Okay. So, so I, I know, I know specifically there were signs removed up in the knoll and then uh, Moulter in mission and on mission heading towards Rocky Hill. I guess I'm kind of confused as to how that could be misinterpreted. I, and I know this is conjecture because we don't have the employee here. Um, I guess my Second question would be, what steps has the city taken to um, rectify this situation? Now, like I mentioned before, we've made sure that we have reinforced the, the process with all of staff so that there is a, a clear understanding of what the process is, what it isn't, and how you confirm uh, if, if there's a, sp a suspicion that you have a conflict or, a, or a, a, you, you're not quite sure whether a sign is on private property or in the right of way. In addition to that, like I mentioned in some email communication, we've taken a specific corrective action in the individual case that's consistent with our personnel manual. And so we believe that that is going to be uh, effective. Um, it's, it's going to do what it's designed to do is to correct that going forward. I guess just to follow up with that, has has there been any attempt uh, by the city to correct the situation externally to remedy the fact that signs were moved and and uh, and not replaced where they had been previously? Not that I'm aware of. Well, we talked about this. We, you know, with the city, you know, Mark, we talked about this you know, about city was requested to put those signs back where they were removed from, but there was. I know if, if that's know, what you mean by I externally, what, I, I think that's what. Jeff's yeah, asking. I guess that's really the question, because ultimately it's my understanding that, you know, while it's apparent that that it was a mistake that the signs were removed. Um, it, it's on my understanding that it's also it was a, an action that was uh, not legal to do. Correct. So, you know, the city is recognizing it as, you know, this is a mistake. We didn't mean to do this. Um, obviously we're dealing with private property here. Um, so, you know, signs went up after that fact, uh, in place of the ones that had been in those locations. So I guess the question is what, you know, what, uh, fiduciary duty, I guess I would say, does the city have to rectify that situation and make sure that everything goes back to where it was previously? I don't know that the city has a fiduciary responsibility, but in terms of authority uh i don't i don't believe the city has the authority to replace 
or remove signs uh, or compel that they be replaced or removed. And so, Sean, do you have any? Well, I, I think, uh, Mark, an answer to your question, Jed, is I think in context, the, the signs removed, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, was um, there were four signs, I believe was a total, and either the day of removal or the next day, the candidates received the signs back. So to the extent they wanted to place them back on the private property, they certainly could have done that, but it was up to the candidates. I'm not sure of the, the number of signs. Okay, but... no, my, my misunderstanding, but as far as the return, was it either the day of or the next day that the candidates received their signs? I, they were placed out here. I believe it's correct that they were all retrieved within a couple of days. So from a standpoint of externally, the signs were removed, but then provided back to the candidates to place them wherever they chose to, to put them. With no notification. I, I, what do you mean by notification? There was no notification yeah. the signs were removed. Not initially, no. So how could I know to go get my sign a day or two later? Well, I, from that standpoint, um, I think there was some communication. I don't know exactly what it was, whether each individual candidate was notified or not. I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if there was notification or not. It's my understanding that all of the signs that were picked up in this, what I'll call a sweep on this on this day, which I believe was the 17th of uh, August, were picked up either on that day or the day after. Um, that's that's my understanding. But I don't I don't believe the candidates whose signs were involved were contacted to say, "Hey, we picked up your signs and you can get them here," which is what has happened in the past. I, I would have to rely on the the candidates whose signs were were removed to tell me that. I don't I don't know that. It doesn't sound like, from what Mayor Pro Tem is saying, it doesn't sound like there was any communication that went out. I'll just say this for the record. My sign was one of the signs involved. And I know the corner that you're talking about, you just stated it was Apple Way and Malter. Malter. So I had four signs taken in completely different locations at the same time frame. So nowhere is near that intersection. Um, and no phone call. I understand yeah. probably not a whole lot's going to happen over that and I understand that you're not willing to to assist with replacing the signs fine by me but for the record there was four other locations at the same time frame i think at a, at a minimum we need to figure out what's still out there and what the candidates know that the signs are there out there in the enclosure yeah okay um sure we can do that Go ahead, Councilmember Kurtz. I mean, to that end, I understand that there was a mistake that happened. Um, but as a candidate, which I feel like some of this discussion is bordering on whether it's a conflict of interest for us to discuss this as candidates here. Um, but I saw this stuff on Facebook, which leads us back to probably needing to bring the social media policy back up and put that on agenda sometime soon. Um, and I called to find out what happened to the signs. And I came down here and I found three of my signs next to the dumpster and i didn't even have a sign in one of those locations so i don't know where the signs came from no harm no foul they'll get put up where they're supposed to be i assume um, that they were taken down because they weren't in the right place um so i think that there is some personal responsibility for us as candidates to go ahead and take care of that ourselves versus relying on city staff to go out and fix a problem that i don't think like you said have the authority to do that on our behalf as candidates um so again, I, I just, um, if you, now we're asking people to go out and look at the dumpster. When you guys leave tonight, go look at the dumpster, find out if your sign's there. That's what I did. Um, and I would encourage us all to do that as well. I think we spent a lot of time on this and I understand that there's been a lot of um, negative emotions out there in the social media world, um, but there is some personal responsibility to take care of our campaigns ourselves. Um, and I would just ask that um, all of us um, do that individually versus again, um, spending a lot of time in city business on stuff that I don't, I mean, I, I see that there's some overlap between it being our responsibility to talk about it here, but then also a conflict of interest to continue to talk as candidates about our signs here. Any other comments or questions? Go ahead, that's when we're done. I'll, I'll just venture to say that I'm resolute that city staff should not be entering private property to place political signs. Even if it isn't a replacing gesture, I just don't think there's any role for city staff to do that. 
That's what hurts. Just one last thing. Um, I'm not going to take anybody's signs down. If somebody's fine, sign falls down, um, whether it's the candidate that's opposing me, whether it's anybody else, I'll put your sign back up when I'm out there. I'm not here to take down anybody's sign. I'm not going to, um, I, hopefully nobody that supports me would take down anybody's signs, but um, I hope that we all have enough courtesy for each other that we're not out encouraging or stealing or moving signs. Um, I don't know that there's that kind of shenanigans going on in the community and I hope that there's not, but I wouldn't be a part of it. Okay. All right, all right. that right. concludes my report. Okay, dope. All right, so we are moving on to Community Engagement Commission. Robin, welcome. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. I have no signs. <laughs> so, what I'd like to do is have the, I will wait just for a minute there, the PowerPoint. Okay, tonight I'm going to present through a PowerPoint. And we've been busy, and in August, we had two important milestones and benchmarks to meet. So one of them is the ordinance said need to provide a report to the mayor's council no later than the August, and it needed to have the components of, they said past activities, and I noticed, I called it accomplishments. If we could go to the next page, please. There we go. So in that report, I we put is an introduction and we call it accomplishments, looking at our 2024 expectations and plans. And then that fulfilled the obligations of what in the criteria of the ordinance. We had another important accomplishment to meet and that was our budget and decide how what we would spend it on, how much we needed and how much we needed to request. We combined them both into one report and then put some exhibits of some of the things that we've done. Some fun stuff. I like fun. <laughs> so that's what we were busy with. And we met that obligation. We was able to file that with the city clerk. I think it was August the 25th. And you should be able to review that soon. And it's only about five pages. So it should not put you to sleep. Should be easy. With that, we'll go into recent activities. So next slide. So we have constant representation at the farmer's market, barefoot in the park, golf cart parade. Those are just some examples, trailhead ribbon ceremony. And I think that that's been good for us to have that out there and understand the community. We are continually doing the outreach on the to the community to assist in the gathering of the survey information for the funding priorities for the budget to get everyone that information needed when you start that process. Of course, we continue to have our CEC monthly meetings and another bullet point that's not up there is we are developing a framework or an outline for Proposals when project sponsors provide that to us, it might be in form of a not only a process, but might include some checklist items so that we don't immediately jump and start to do things more. We do it more proactively versus reactively. And so that it's a nicer, it's a better more accommodating process for everybody and organized. So we're looking at that. And we appreciate the mayor and the city council having the workshop with us. That helped us incredibly. That's going to help us now as we continue through for this next year on even our goals, how we approach things and Thank you. So next slide. A 
I just titled this fun stuff. So at the farmer's market, CEC always usually has some type of display and it's an interactive display so everyone can join in. So it's the end of summer. We called it the favorite summer vacation display. And if you notice over on the other end, you'll see Spider-Man visited us. We had a lot of interaction there. People wanting pictures with Spider-Man and selfies. And then, of course, in the middle, everybody loves a pooch. And that always gains the traction. So are there any questions or comments? I don't see any vote. I'm looking forward to looking at through the budget and getting it incorporated for next year. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, everyone. Okay, Spokane Valley Fire Department, Chief Soto, thanks for sticking with us. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members, City Officials, and my fellow citizens. Uh, we'll be bringing you the August numbers for our responses. If I could, there we go. Okay, so uh, for the month of August, we had just over 1,900 calls. Those calls equated to just over 2,500 responses. Uh, year to date, we're just over 15,000 calls with just over 20,000 responses. 82% uh, of our calls are EMS in nature. And uh, currently, our, our it's the same usual suspects as our busiest units, uh, Engine 1, Engine 7, Engine 8, and Ladder 10. So uh, while we're not as busy as last year, again, we are uh, still moving in shape. Next slide, please. Uh, for auto aid and mutual aid, uh, you can see the numbers. Well, actually, you probably can't, and I apologize for that. Uh, but we uh, generally are responding with the City of Spokane, uh, Fire District 8, Fire District 9, and uh, vice versa. So uh, just uh, general numbers regarding that. Next slide, please. Uh, for our station area incidents, uh, generally it's usually station seven that's usually at the top, but this time it's uh, station eight. So station eight, station seven, uh, station one and 10 are usually uh, our busiest areas. And of course, this does indicate that as well with uh, station eight taking uh, roughly 16% of the calls for the month. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a comparison of year to year. Uh, of the calls, uh, blue being 2023 and red uh, 2022. Um, again, in comparison to last year's numbers, so you can see we're uh, pretty much in step with those numbers. Next slide, please. Overall, um, our August numbers were the third busiest that we've had uh, for the month. Uh, we are about 293 calls short of last year. So we're, uh, again, we are uh, still busy, but not, uh, it equates to probably just over a call a day, less than last year. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, numbers wise, we're 1.9% uh, lower than last year's numbers. Uh, however, while our EMS numbers have dropped off a little bit, uh, obviously our fire numbers have gone up and uh, and we've all been experiencing that, seeing that uh, on uh, day-to-day family, friends, and in the news. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, specific to Liberty Lake. So for the month of August, we had 97 calls. Of those 97 calls, 82% um, or 80 of them were for EMS with uh, 55 of those being advanced life support, so requiring paramedics. Uh, we did have three fires plus a, a brush fire. Uh, however, they were all minor in comparison to what we had going on with the Great Fire and the Oregon Fire. Next slide, please. Uh, year to date, uh, we've had 855 calls. We've had 80% uh, our EMS in nature. Um, and again, ALS is our the most amount of our calls of the 855, 448 for Fred Advanced Life Support. So, uh, Still moving and shaking here. Um, that is my report for this evening. Do you have any questions? 
Go ahead. This is one question, Chief. Oh. Yes, the station that's right here in Country Vista, what number is it? Three. 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 Station three. Thank yes, you, sir. Anybody else? No, I've got a question. Um, yes, how many of your uh, your firefighters did you have to deploy to the two biggest fires in the last couple of weeks? So um, uh, I was actually um, off that day. I, I say that because I'm never really off. I, so um, obviously when I found out what was going on, I rushed back here um, and, and did a all call back for everyone, all my personnel. And so we staffed an additional uh, three engines, a ladder and three brush trucks. And then we sent them everywhere. So we sent uh, four units up to the Oregon road fire and uh, four to the Great Fire. Ironically, while we were sending people to the Great Fire, um, my wife was upstairs and called me and said, hey, there's a bunch of smoke coming from the, you know, the front of the house. And I'll, and of course I'm going like, well, go get the neighbors and get them. She's like, oh, it's not that close. It's towards Mount Spokane. Oh. So then I called up a uh, command at the Great Fire and said, well, what's going on over here? And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, um, look, look to the Northeast, something's going. And so that's how they found out about that. Well, not because of me, but other people were calling in as well. But it, I mean, it all happened just one after another. Um, during that fire, we also had a big fire going off uh, here in our own district as well. So, uh, and additionally, we also sent out the, the helicopter as well to help, uh, get people that were trapped out of the areas as well. So um, it was pretty crazy. Uh, the state expects us uh, initial attack to handle business on our own for the first couple of days. So, um, and then after that, they, they'll they start the state modes and yeah. things of that nature so we can return to regular duty and take care of our own citizens. So, so we did have units available, uh, like I said, but we, we called back everyone. Yeah. that we could get no we appreciate your everybody's hard work and well every day obviously but especially when it comes to challenging times like that so please yeah. pass on our thanks to the rest of your crew will do uh there was roughly uh almost twenty one thousand acres total between them both and uh, like around 710 structures including yeah. homes so it is pretty devastating yes. so no okay. all right go ahead yes ma'am i'd like to personally thank you uh, we have my father-in-law's place that passed away in January up uh, Oregon fire. Oh. And it was roughly, according to the app, about a thousand feet away. So oh. we dropped everything and went up there for phase three and picked up all of his oh. Um And luckily, you know, thanks to the helicopters coming in and dropping, um, you've saved so many Places. Thank you. Yeah, well, those ones weren't weren't, weren't ours. Uh, that was a DNR, uh, and they did phenomenal. Uh, ours was specific to just trying to get people out and yeah. if we could that were stuck. But certainly, uh, my guys, you know, all just came flooding in, and we were just shipping them all. And that was just the units, so that doesn't even count the overhead. So sending a chief officer to go help run this, and a chief officer to go help run that. So uh, they all did awesome. Everybody. D8, D9, the city, everybody stood stood up and helped out. So it was, it was Very incredible. Grateful. Great teamwork. Yeah, when, they, when they're turning away volunteers and they're saying, hey, stop giving us water, uh, I was like, wow. I mean, we were like, hey, we have a shower trailer. We'll bring it. They're like, just stop. <laughs> you know, so that was that was great to see that the community stood up and helped each other out. So. Yep. Okay. Thanks again. Yes, ma'am. All right. Yes, it's pretty good. All right. The Relay Lake Sewer and Water. Nada, thanks for coming. Evening, everyone. I'll be really quick. A um, couple of things. Uh, we have a building expansion that's going to go on through the end of the year. Not nearly as exciting as your facility expansion, but our little tiny one's going to keep going on. If you have any business at the sewer district, uh, this door's to the left. There's a little sign that's over on the side. Um, now that the rains have come back and summer is over, people are turning their sprinklers off. I'm happy to announce that we have only three remaining cross-connection backflow prevention folks that are out there that haven't actually complied yet. So um, we're working on those last three. We'll get them done, I hope, or their water will get turned off. Uh, the large development to the east of us that everyone's asking about, we had some issues with sewer services we were going to provide for that. Here's what I'm talking about. The, the, um, 
uh, it's the Marine RV. Oh yeah. 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 So just to report to you all, there were some issues with what sewer services we could provide. We aren't set up to provide, to take in largely concentrated chemically treated sewage. Like you'd come out of a black water tank yeah. in an RV. So we had to work with them on that. I think we've come to a, an understanding of what we can and can't take. So we can take some of their stuff, but not all of it. They're going to have to pump it out like the other folks do at the campground. And then I didn't do any research on this had I known these conversations would come up, but two quick map things. One is um, on the issue of Liberty Drive and the guardrail. Mm -hmm. People have talked to me about that before too and said, why doesn't the sewer district do something? Most of that land is not sewer district right. land. There's a little tiny piece, I think. And even that has the setbacks that are required. So it's not an issue with um, the sewer and water district wanting to not do anything there. It's, it's sort of out of our hands as far as I understand. And the other thing I would say is um, if anybody sees any political signs on district land, please let us know because that's not something that we we do. So I don't know exactly where some of our property lines are too over by the highway where the well is. Um, but if anybody sees any not appropriate, that's not something that we would support one way or the other. So just let us know. Any right. questions for me? Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Okay. All right, deep breath. We're on to consent agenda. Make a motion to approve general business consent agenda items 10 A, B, C, and D. Second. We have a second from council when we're done. Any questions, comments? Not hearing any, all in favor of, of approving consent agenda items A, B, C, and D, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes 7 0. General business item 11 1, I'll call it. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion to confirm the mayor's appointment of Charlie Jenks as a voting member of the Planning Commission. Second. And a second from Councilmember Salberg. Any questions? I thought he was going to be here. I thought he was going to be here, Lisa. I don't see him on uh, well, on we... Zoom. We we just so he was yeah. recently appointed as a as an adjunct member. Um, Tim Olson stepped down, and then um, Paul Brown moved out of the city limits while he was, he's still very local um, and the planning commission does allow for somebody outside the city limits to be on. He didn't feel right staying in the position. So that's why we actually have two open. And so um, Charlie is a gentleman with the experience from Maui and um, that you guys talked to, like I said, not, not too long ago. So um, he's been doing a, a great job on the commission um, based on my, some feedback from Lisa and the other commissioners. So I felt it appropriate to move his name forward to a voting member. Anything you want to add, Lisa? No, um, and he did intend to be here tonight. I'm not sure what happened, but it was his intention to be here. But yeah, he's he's brought um, a great uh, wealth of knowledge to the Planning Commission, and um, his his background and experience is really valuable. Um, I, he's, he asks really good questions, which I think is, is really helpful, um, to the rest of the planning commission also. Great. Thank you. And just to remind everybody, even if you're an adjunct member, you usually end up voting anyway, because usually somebody's missing, <laughs> um, just, just, a, as a reminder. So anybody else have any questions? Yeah, just, go ahead. Just, uh, congratulations. That's great that we're having him on there as not adjunct but a regular member but when it comes to consent i always think that a planning commission or anyone being put onto a commission really needs to be you know for the public to yeah. know that they're coming on yeah well and they like said you know um we've been putting everything under consent and then having people at the meeting ask to what to be moved off so and again I, yeah i was in the impression he was going to be here too but hopefully he's a little fresh in your mind um from the a couple months ago yes all right any other questions all right not hearing any all in favor of um confirming the appointment of charlie jenks as a voting member please say aye aye, aye. aye. all right any opposed all right motion passes six one all right next one big motion uh for general business item 11 to the Authorize the award of contract in the amount of $1,086,060 to Judge Netting Mountain West for the replacement of poles and nettings at the driving range and authorize the staff managed contingency in the amount of $65,200. Second. Oh, sorry, you, Kenny. 
I couldn't hear. Second. Okay, yeah. thanks. Second from Councilmember Kurtz. <clears throat> All right, I'm sure there are questions, and Lisa is at hand to answer any questions. Go ahead, Councilmember Foyer. Uh, two questions. First one, I didn't see anywhere, and I might have missed it, but I didn't see anywhere in the contract the cost to remove and dispose of the existing. And uh, do you have any idea of a timeline, how long the range would be shut down for it? Yes, I have answers to both those questions. So um, this was a lump sum contract. We bid it as a lump sum. The the uh, responsibility to remove and dispose of was on the contractor uh, for both nets, netting and pools. Um, so there is there is that. Um, with regard to the timeline, so we have given them a period from October 1st to March 31st to replace them. They've got 60 working days, but they do get to pause it uh, due to in inclement weather. We wanted to get this done while um, with the least impact to uh, golf operations. Um, uh, talking to Kurt Ecker, who is the principal with um, Judge Netting, um, he indicates that his lead time, if this is approved tonight, his lead time uh, is uh, about a uh, about two months to get the polls. So he's anticipating that he's going to be starting in November. Um, so that's that's the timeline. He has no concerns about being able to complete it before the March thirty first deadline. Any other questions? Uh, I, I guess I go back to the disposal, removal and disposal. Does it need to be part of the contract? Because on the on the um, base bid, it only talks about installation. It was part of the, it, there was, it, first of all, there was um, an addendum that was issued that where that, that was clarified, but it was actually incorporated into the bid specifications. And you can actually see it on the plan sheet that it is their responsibility to remove those. Again, it was not broken out as a separate cost. And because it was explicitly part of the bid specifications, um, it can't be removed without a change order. And if you change order it out of there, um, then we're gonna have to rebid it because somebody else may have had a, a better uh, bid proposal uh, had they been given the opportunity not to have to dispose of them. I'm not looking for that. I'm just, uh, and I, I believe you, Lisa, it's just, I, I don't see it here, but you have something that says they'll do it, correct, in writing? Have, have, so, yes. Uh, so so okay. that it's part of the, did you look through the, I didn't provide the whole bid packet because with all the plans and specifications because it's like, a, a, like 86 pages. I understand. The, but the contract you. package. That's okay. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> All right. Next question. I think Member Cargill had his hand up. Uh, thank you, uh, Lisa. A question for you, and then maybe it's a question for Kyle. Um, what are these poles made of? They're they're made of aluminum. They're metal poles. Um, steel poles. I'm not. It, the, the engineer specified them. I'm not. So they're going to be a lot. Uh, the reason why I'm asking is basically just to confirm they're going to be a lot better than the the wood ones that we have there now. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and they are designed so the design for the for the poles and netting we have eighty foot poles on the city hall side, sixty feet on the arboretum side, forty feet on the golf side, with each of them designed to be able to extend an additional twenty feet. Um, if we find that's necessary over time. Okay, so that leads me to my Kyle question. And that is, do Kyle, do I know this is the question we keep coming back to. Do we have any indication from our insurance company that 80 is gonna be enough on that one side? Yeah, so we've brought them along this entire way and, and consistently we've heard from them that this is gonna meet what we need. And if we continue to see issues, then that is something that we have to address down the road. But they are covering this in full. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? All right. One last Yeah, comment. go ahead. I just want to say uh, I'm pleasantly pleased at the price because there was a conversation in this very room that was two to three times more than mm -hmm. that number at one point. So yep. um, well done. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? 
Not seeing any. All in favor of approving general business item one. Um, where'd they go? The award in award the contract to Judge Netting. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Any opposed? All right. Motion passes seven zero. All right. Next. Hmm. Okay. Council comment. Oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I thought I was thinking we had another one to vote on. Sorry. Um, so council comments, do we have anything um, else from the council before we move to public hearings um, for tonight? Not seeing any. So we'll move on to our public hearing. Um, this one is for the proposed establishment of a transportation benefit district for the purpose of implementing a 0.1% sales tax to fund street maintenance and operations. Ms. Kel Kelsey, do you need to read anything in before I open it? No. Okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and open the public hearing on item A. Um, so if there's anybody in chambers who'd like to make a comment or online, again, please online let uh, Jacob, our meeting host, know that you'd like to make a comment. And those in, in chambers, just uh, fill out a quick sheet or make sure you just stand up and come to the podium and state your name. Um, we can go from there. Here. Anybody here? Just for record, Kelsey, 829. Thank you. All right, anybody online, Jacob? All righty, we'll go on once. Well, since, since, since the computer times is 8.32, we'll close at 8.32. Those are the past three minutes. All right, so no comments on the public hearing. So we'll go ahead and move to resolutions. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, sorry. Make a motion to approve resolution number 23250, resolution of City of Liberty Lake, Washington, authorizing Spokane County Hearing Examiner to serve in the role of Hearing Examiner Pro Tem. Wait. Second. Yeah, second from Council Member Dunn. Should I read the title? Yeah. Okay. Resolution number 23-250, a resolution of the City of Liberty Lake, Washington, authorizing Spokane County Hearing Examiner to serve in the role of Hearing Examiner Pro Tem. Okay. So do we have, we have a motion and a second. Do we have questions about why we're having to do this? Oops. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I, as I read through the original document with the city of Spokane, it was dated December 2nd of 2014, and it refers to an hourly do dollar amount. If we maybe revise this agreement to 2023 pay scale, so yeah, so I'm gonna let Lisa answer that. There's a reason. There's a specific reason why we're having to go this direction. So I'll let her give that background and answer her question. And I have a second question sure. after that. Yeah. So the so the answer is um, no. It has not been updated, and the uh, hearing examiner has honored those fees. Wow. <laughs> they won't complain. I'll shut up. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Uh, my next question is, can anybody speak to the reasoning for being in an agreement with this? Well, I guess I know the answer to that. Okay. Uh, why we haven't um, uh, compared the to the county or for the service, the county or the city of Spokane, but I know the answer, so never mind. <laughs> and, and the reason we're having to do this is uh, with regards to the public hearing for um, for the, uh, the Greenstone appeal to the... Um, charges on the uh, containers and so our our public hearing our hearing examiner had to recuse himself and the county wanted the council's buy-in to to use theirs did i get that right lisa yeah you got that right i will say that the uh the counties the county has their own rate schedule but this is a cost recovery it is on the applicant to pay the hearing examiner fees even better Thank you. Okay. And technically, it's the river crossing HOA that's appealing, although that may that's not true. be accurate. <clears throat> Did you have something? Yeah, I was just going to say that the parties agreed to use the county's um, hearing examiner in light of um, the city of Spokane's hearing examiner recusal, and the county wanted to have something from the city authorizing to use the hearing pro tem in this particular situation. So that's why the resolution came forward um, to do that. Okay. Not hearing any other questions. 
Um, we'll go ahead and see if there's any, as this is a resolution, is there any public comment either here or online? I'll skip the instructions unless we have somebody raise their hand. All right, not hearing any. All in favor of approving resolution 23-250, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion passes 7-0. Ordinances. First read, Kelsey. Ordinance number 297, an ordinance of the City of Liberty Lake, Washington, establishing the City of Liberty Lake Transportation Benefit District, establishing boundaries and authority of the district, and improvements and operations to be funded by the district. Okay, thank you. I know this is just a first read, but does anybody have any questions? I know we've obviously had workshops on it. We'll go Councilmember Cargill and Councilmember um, Salberg. Thank you. I was just going to uh, make a comment um, to, to make sure that the citizens know that we're talking about this with the intention that we would possibly replace the utility tax. And so it's important for people to know that it is not necessarily a double tax here. Uh, we're talking about starting one that would be more widespread uh, and then getting rid of the utility tax or greatly reducing the utility tax. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Salberg. Mind the same question that I ask every time that we have a first reading. Okay. Would there be a benefit to move, making a motion to the second reading to move this along? Since we're not making any financial decision, we're only establishing the district. Uh, but if it's not an emergency, are we time bound on this? Usually we don't like to... But so, to, no, the answer is no, we are not time bound at this moment. Um, it, it, it's up to council on on whether or not um, the subsequent action that wasn't going to be considered tonight was, as everybody knows, uh, council review and vote on the implementation of the 0.1% sales tax subsequent to the adoption of the TBD. Um, but I'll leave that for you all to discuss. Yeah, I just just traditionally, unless it's an emergency. So the exigency don't... that I was considering was yeah. that there are several people sitting in this room that are going to be running for office, that are running for office. And um, if we could get this part out of the way, it wouldn't necessarily be a part of their questions that they have to answer because everything that is on social media is a misrepresentation of what this is. Yeah. So. Understood, but I, I, and that's up to you guys to decide, but um, personally, I think that needs to run its course and let people ask, have to give them the due time between now and the second read in another meeting to ask their questions. That's just my Sorry. personal opinion. Anybody else? Uh, no, I would agree. If there's not a time limit, then I, I give citizens another opportunity to weigh in, not that we've heard any yet. So Because there will be another chance for public input right. at the second read. Okay. So uh, uh, can I add something? Yeah, sure. Um, just, just so anybody listening to this later is clear, this is an ordinance to establish. It, it says nothing about any action items that come to that are to follow, correct? Correct. Right. Yes. Thank you. Yep. That just gives the option of later doing it. Okay. If there's no more questions and we will comments, we will move ahead. Um, we have no emergency ordinances. We have a, a introduction of upcoming agenda items. Uh, and I'm just catching up on this um, from having been gone from the last meeting. It looks like we have a pretty full um, agenda on the 19th. Is there any of those? Um, so it looks like okay, we got the clock safety already moved to there. Tiff and Lift, Kyle, are you going to be ready for that? Where, where'd you go? <laughs> you keep moving seats on me. So uh, this is another one that is not specifically time bound. It's just very, it's appropriate to bring up as we get into budget season. Mm -hmm. So uh, if this got pushed to the first meeting in October, certainly wouldn't be the end of the world. This is just a snapshot in time and it's a resolution of, Here's the next three projects or next three years of projects mm -hmm. that the city and developer are going to focus on. Right. Well, as we go through agenda reviews over the next couple of weeks, if we'll put it on there just, and sure. hopefully I don't think anything else will be, will take a ton of time out of those. Um, except maybe this presentation from the Spokane Clean Air Agency. I don't know how much time we'll give them, but we'll work through that through agenda review. Hopefully we'll be able to keep everything on there on the 19th. Can we give them a time limit? Yeah, we can. Thank you. Okay. And we make sure we'll, we'll put the timer up on them <laughs> because in the past that hasn't worked. We give them usually five minutes to present and five minutes for question. It doesn't usually work out. All right. Thanks, Kyle. 
All right, anybody, uh, anything else somebody wants to put on the um, advanced workshop agenda? Council Member Card Cardio. Thank you, I have a two um, items. One, I'm hoping we can have a discussion, perhaps it's October 3rd may be the best time, about transparency requirements in the city and public notice on uh, different agenda items, not necessarily for this um, council, but for uh, some of our commissions um, and boards that we have. Um, and then the second one isn't necessarily a, an, a, um, a workshop discussion, but something that I was thinking about the other day. We're kind of in a unique situation where two of our council seats that are up for election, once the election is certified, those switch over. Yeah. Um, and if um, instead of having it be at the, the very first of the year, it happens in November. And so I'm wondering if we ought to work back from that time frame to get the budget completed so that if those, if we have new council members who are coming on board, the very first vote that they have to take is on a brand new budget that they haven't done really anything about. Yeah. And actually Mark and I have worked through that quite a bit. So what the plan is, um, Let's, you know, assuming that those positions, it's very clear yeah. on election night that it's not yeah. close. The plan is to kind of, kind of do a, a speed, speed dating of, of City Academy and a walk through the budget so that they are ready okay. um, when, when that vote does come in December. Okay. Lots of one-on-one -on -one going through the budget separately with them and whatnot, whatever it's going to take to get them ready. Okay. All right. So um, probably need a little bit more clarity. Um on your request for the other one, but we'll get together with you on that and okay. so we can put the appropriate title on it. All right, anybody else? Council Member Kurtz. I mentioned earlier um, the social media code of ethics policy. Um, and we've talked a lot about social media tonight. This has been a TBD agenda item for two years. I first brought it up in September. Well, we, we brought it back earlier yeah. this year, but we didn't do much yes, on it. Yes, but we we have yeah. not completed the work, yeah. I think is my, um, my point. And I do think that it is timely that we do complete the work. And so I would like to talk about this sooner rather than later. Okay. All right, yeah, as I know you had a small committee and then it kind of just kind of- Yeah, and then we, we got new staff. Yeah. We've had, yeah, there's been a lot of reasons, but- yeah. We need to move forward. Yeah. Okay. I'll get me. I'll um get you up on that maybe later this week, and we'll we still have it on there. We'll uh, take it off of February twenty first and put the put that on there. All right. Anybody else? All right. Not hearing any. We are back to citizen comments. One more shot. And if there's anybody here in chambers or online, we'd like to make a comment. Um, if you're online, shoot Jacob a note, our meeting host, and she'll let me know. If you're here in chambers, just raise your hand. Do we have anybody online there? Nope. All right. Um, so not hearing any citizen comments. Um, we do not have an executive session. So if nobody's opposed, we will go ahead and adjourn. All right. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody on that proclamation uh, yeah. issue.